The fables, allegories, and types of the ancients, being of three classes, import sometimes various meanings. Therefore, some of the ceremonies to which sublime import is attached are also applied to typify less dignified operations in the natural system. Thus, for instance, the fable of Proserpine, which alludes to the immersion of the soul into the body, was also employed to symbolize the operation of the seed in the ground. But the general doctrine of Plato, of the descent of the soul into the darkness, of the body, the perils of the passions, the, tor the torments of vices, appears to be perfectly described by Virgil, though this poet was of the Epicurean sect, the most fashionable of his day. The lesser mysteries represented, as we have seen, the descent of the soul into the body, and the pains therein suffered. The greater mysteries were intended to typify by the splendid visions, or the happy state of the soul, both here and hereafter, when purified from the defilements of material nature. These doctrines are also inculcated by the fables of the fortunate islands, the Elysian fields, etc. The different purifications in these rites were symbols of the gradation of virtues, necessary to the reascent of the soul. Inward purity, of which external purifications were symbols, can only be obtained by the exercise of these virtues. To the illusion of these virtues must be understood what Socrates says, that it is the business of the philosophers to study to die, and to be themselves death. And as at the same time he reprobates suicide, such death cannot mean any other but philosophical death, or the exercise of what he calls the cathartic virtues. If such was the meaning and import of the Eleusinian and Dionysian rites, symbols and ceremonies, it must be allowed that a society or sect which was employed in the contemplation of such sublime truths cannot be looked upon as trifling or profligate. The very Christian fathers who so strongly attacked the pagan religion confessed the utility of these symbols and that the circumstances previous to initiation into those mysteries tended to exclude impious notions and prepare the mind to hear the truth. Those mysteries were concealed from the vulgar because it would be ridiculous prostitution of such sublime theories to disclose them to the multitude incapable of understanding them, even when many of the initiates, for want of study and application, did not comprehend the whole meaning of those symbols. The multitude were told only in the abstract, the doctrine of a future state of rewards and punishments, and were made acquainted with the calendar, the result of astronomical observations, the knowledge of which was connected with their festivities and agricultural pursuits. They were likewise taught other practical parts of science calculated for general use. The secrecy of these mysteries was the first cause of ob obloquy against them. Next came, beyond doubt, the depravity of their followers and the perversion of those assemblies into convivial meetings first, and then into the most debauched associations. Secrecy also was enjoined by the laws. It was death to reveal anything belonging to the Eleusinian mysteries. To disclose imprudently anything about them was supposed even indecorous. Of this we find a very conspicuous instance in Plutarch. Out of respect for this custom, the scholars were, in general, only instructed in the exoteric doctrines. The acroamatic doctrines were taught only to the few select by private communication and viva voce. But when the ignorance of the very teachers of those mysteries caused their forms to be only to be attended to, the essence was lost. The shadow only remained, and then even those forms and ceremonies were frequented by persons ignorant of their import and wicked enough to turn them to their private interests. 
as a machine employed in deceiving the people and to occasions of debauchery and depravity. We shall give an example of this. The mysteries of Eleusis or the, of the sun were united or analogous to those of Dionysius or Bacchus, because according to the Orphic theology, the intellect of every planet was denominated Bacchus. So when the sun was considered as a spiritual intelligence who moved or caused this planet to move in its annual cycle, he was denominated Triatiricus Bacchus. The ceremonies, therefore, of Bacchus were attended with rejoicings as the triumph of the spirit over matter. But this circumstance, so intimately connected with the sublime notions of the Eleusinian mysteries, was completely turned into mere banqueting and processions of drunken people who of the ceremonies knew nothing else than to carry the branches of trees in their hands. More, still, a depraved priest introduced those Bacchanalian mysteries into Rome for the very worst of purposes, which, alarming the Senate, the most severe punishment was inflicted upon him and his followers. In consequence of those abuses, it was that Socrates refused to be initiated, and the same did Diogenes, alleging that Patriarchon, a notorious robber, had obtained initiation. Epaminondas and also Agesilus never desired it. But if those who were desirous of being licentious clothed themselves with those mysteries, this has nothing to do with the original tenets of the institution. For the purity of its votaries was carried, according to the primitive mysteries, to the most delicate and scrupulous point. After such respectable authorities as we have referred to, we must reject as impudent calumnies the assertion of Tertullian, who says that the natural parts of a man were enclosed in the ark carried about in the procession of those mysteries. Theodoret and Anobius say they were the parts of a woman. Such assertions had no means of ascertaining what was not known to anyone out of the precincts of those most recondite mysteries. We should rather guess that, in the ark carried in the procession and said to enclose the body of Osiris, spheres were deposited representing our solar system. In regard to these accusations, found in some of the ecclesiastical writers, we must also observe that many of them, led by a mistaken zeal for the Christian religion, disfigured in a most reprehensible degree the ancient historical monuments. Taking, for instance, the manner in which the history of Egypt was written by Manathon. What was transmitted to us by those ecclesiastical writers, others of such writers in fact knew nothing of the Egyptian mysteries. The conclusion, therefore, is that the motives of those institutions were good and pure, as tending to the study of science and practice of morality, through, though the same institutions afterwards degenerated, and their degeneration was followed by the ruin of the state, as predicted by Trismegistus himself, who in this prediction proved how great a philosopher and politician he was. Having thus established what was the meaning and import of the Eleusinian or Dionysian mysteries amongst the ancient Greeks, who transmitted to us the knowledge of them, and having shown that the ceremonies were not intended in their origin as worship of the sun, considered as a deity, we shall proceed to examine how those mysteries were communicated to other nations by the Greeks. About 50 years before the building of the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, a colony of Grecians, chiefly Ionians, complaining of the narrow limits of their country in an increased population, emigrated and having been settled in Asia Minor, gave to that country the name of Ionia. No doubt that that people carried with them their manners, sciences and religion, and the mysteries of Eleusius among the rest. Accordingly, we find that one of their cities, 
Byblos was famed for the worship of Apollo, as Apollonia had been with their ancestors. These Ionians, participating in the improved state of civilization in which their mother country Greece then was, cultivated the sciences and useful arts, but made themselves most conspicuous in architecture and invented or improved upon the order called by their own name Ionian. These Ionians formed a society whose purpose was to employ themselves in erecting buildings. The general assembly of the society was first held at Theos, but afterwards, in consequence of some civil commotions, passed to Lebedos. This sect or society was now called the Dionysian Artificers, as Bacchus was supposed to be the inventor of building theatres, and they performed the Dionysian festivals. They afterwards extended themselves to Syria, Persia and India. From this period, the science of astronomy, which had given rise to the symbols of the Dionysian rites, became connected with types taken from the art of building. These Ionian societies divided themselves into different sections or minor assemblies. Some of those small or dependent associations had also their distinguishing names. But they extended their moral views in conjunction with the art of building to many useful purposes and to the practice of acts of benevolence. We find recorded that these societies and the utility were many years afterwards inquired into by Cambyses, king of Persia, who approved of them and gave them great marks of favour. It is essential to observe that these societies had significant words to distinguish their members, and for the same purpose they used emblems taken from the art of building. Let us now notice the passage of the Dionysian artificers to Judea. Solomon attained from Hiram, king of Tyre, men skillful in the art of building when the temple was erected at Jerusalem. Amongst the foreigners who came on this occasion, we find men from Gabal, called Giblam, that is to say, the Ionians settled in Asia Minor, for Gabal, or Byblos, was that city where stood the temple of Apollo, where the Eleusinian rites, or Dionysian mysteries, were celebrated as we have already stated. We could, in addition to this argument, produce some authority, for Josephus says that the Grecian style of architecture was used at the Temple of Jerusalem. After this, we cannot be surprised to find that the ceremonies of Eleusis or Thamos should be introduced into to Judea, particularly as Solomon himself after having entered into the scientific illusions in the construction of the temple, was not free from the accusation of the gross superstition of idolatry. So we find, some years afterwards, the prophet Ezekiel complaining that the Israelitish women were weeping for Thamuz at a certain period of the year at the very gates of the temple. But it is natural to suppose that the Dionysian artificers would not have attempted to introduce those rites amongst the religious Jews as a mere matter of idolatry for the worship of the sun. The ideas of the Israelites concerning the unity of God would have revolted at anything inducing a belief of the polytheism of the Gentiles. The symbol, therefore, in these mysteries must have been explained to the Jews to mean only the sun in the true and original sense of those mysteries, that is to say, as an emblem of God's goodness to man, and the apparent motions of that luminary, first as the guide for fixing the seasons, next as types or remembrances of the, the immortality of the soul. For this dogma does not appear either clear in the books of the Jews before that period, or universally admitted amongst them at a much later date. To avoid, therefore, any allusion to idolatry in these ceremonies and symbols, another personage or another name must have been substituted for Adonis or Osiris. And, as a symbolical death 
and resurrection was essential in the allegory of the system, the history of the death of another individual must have been substituted. However, in framing this new symbolical history, such circumstances were to be related, connected with the death of that personage, as to typify and account for the whole of the Eleusinian mysteries, or the passage of the sun from the upper to the lower hemisphere and its return up again. In the formation of this new system, or rather allegory to the same system, though the name of the hero was changed, the circumstances must have been preserved as far as consistent with new names. The whole fabric of the temple would favour an illusion of this sort. The foundation stone was laid on the second day of the second month, which corresponds upon an average to the 20th of April, reckoning the sacred year upon the fixed zodiac. Now if you rectify your globe to the latitude of Jerusalem, 31 degrees 30 minutes, at that period of the year, you will have the sun in Aries, or the sun represented by a ram or sheep, or a man in sheepskin, as the Hierophant was represented in the Mysteries of Eleusis. Therefore, the very period of the year in which the foundation stone of the temple was laid would afford an opportunity of establishing upon it a new allegorical system to explain the ancient mystery. If we suppose the globe to represent the world in the position above described, the aspirant being in the west, facing the Hierophant, who in the east represents the rising sun, the candidate will find himself between the two tropics, represented by the two columns, which were placed on the west entrance of that temple. The better to understand the facility with which the ancient system could be adapted to the circumstances of the Temple of Jerusalem, we must consider its typic emblems, according to the notions of the Jews and some of the Christian Fathers. The temples built in honour of the several gods were so shaped as to have the allusion to the supposed attributes of such gods. But the universe was supposed by the Platonists to be the true temple of the true and only God. The temple therefore dedicated to the true God was to be a type of the universe. Thus, we find that the Temple of Jerusalem was situated east and west, and with dimensions and types all adapted to represent the universal system of nature. If the Temple of Solomon was a type of the universe, to symbolise that Jehovah was no local God, but the only God, Lord of the universe, tradition also tells us that the place of assembly of the Dionysian artificers was allegorically described by its dimensions, as a symbol of the universe in length, in breadth, in height, and in depth. The ancients represented the course of the stars by the winding of a snake, but if this snake was so placed as to have her tail in her mouth, then it represented eternity. Now if we consider the beginning of the civil war amongst the Hebrews, the month Tisri, which was in the winter equinox, the sun proceeding from thence approaches the south and touches the Tropic of Capricorn, then retrocedes towards the north, crossing the equinoxal and touching the Tropic of Cancer, from whence, retroceding again to the south, arrives at the equinoxial, finishing the year. These points, in an extended map of the two hemispheres, seem separate, but the emblem of the snake biting its tail would represent the end of the year meeting the beginning. Mr. Hutchinson has proved that the globes on top of the two columns at the portico of the temple were orreries, or mechanical representations of the motions of the heavenly bodies. I think, after those circumstances which afforded so many facilities for the introduction of the system of the Dionysian artificers in Judea, the continuance of the same in subsequent periods cannot be of difficult explanation. 
We find it stated in the book of the Maccabees that a society existed in those days in Judea called the Assidians or Cassidians, whose business it was to take care of the repairs of the temple. From these Cassidians proceeded the sect or society of the Essenians, which according to Philo and Josephus were the same as the Assidians, and probably because they admitted no women in their assemblies, Pliny says that they were propagated without wives. Josephus mentions the first of the Essenians in the time of Aristobulus and Antigonus, the son of Hyrcanus, but Suidas and others were of an opinion that they were a branch of the Rechabites who subsisted before the captivity. Josephus, probably ignorant of the secret tenets of the Essenians, also accuses them of worshipping the sun, or saying prayers before the rising sun, as if to incite him to rise. But this very accusation, again, identifies them with that sect of the Dionysian artificers, who, as appears by the reasons above stated, were supposed to adore the sun. Josephus relates many other particulars by which, in a striking manner, he brings to them what we have related of the other societies which preceded them. It also points out the conformity of the ideas with those of the Platonists and the Dionysians on the nature of the soul. In short, they used symbols, allegories and parables after the manner of the ancients. The practices of those Essenians represented by Philo as the most pacific and full of social virtues and amongst them who were the most enthusiastic for their tenants had their goods in common as the Christians had in the first age of Christianity. The Essenians had not their ceremonies and mysteries recorded in history, but thus far as we know that they transmitted to posterity the doctrines which they received from their ancestors, they had also distinguishing signs and the festival banquets, though it does not appear that they followed the profession of builders or architects exclusively. Out of Judea, we find also societies distinguished by the same characteristics as the Essenians, and with the same tenets for Plato. For the Pythagoreans also employed the symbols from the art of building. The Dionysian artificers existed also in Syria, Persia, and in India, and the Eleusinian mysteries were preserved in Europe, even at Rome, until the 8th century of the Christian era. After this epoch, Europe was visited by the most barbarous nations, who, persecuting every scientific research, scattered a general darkness, in which all the labours of the ancients in favour of mankind were nearly lost in the general ignorance of their times. Those societies and sects had also been in former periods much abused, and the ceremonies converted, as we have seen, for the worst of purposes. This was another powerful cause for their decline and ruin. Christianity was then, in Europe, the only bond of moral morality, by which power could, in some measure, be controlled or restrained. When the sciences began to revive, a general fanaticism prevailed, and a spirit of persecution appeared which caused the ancient doctrines of philosophers and the old systems of morality to be regarded only as the offsprings of atheism and practices of idolatry. Under these circumstances, the Eleusinians, the Dionysian artificers, the Assidians or Essenians sunk into such oblivion that no mention is made of them in history. In the 10th century, during the wars of the Crusades, some societies were instituted in Palestine and Europe, which adopted some regulations resembling those of the ancient fraternities. But it was in England, and chiefly in Scotland, where the remains of the old system, identified with that of the Dionysian artificers, were discovered in modern times.